Good morning. Okay. Well, welcome and thank you so much for joining us for what I hope and believe will be a, a quite substantive event. Uh, this year's Transform, I think we have almost 430 attendees, uh, primarily from our customers uh, from around the world and the partners. Um, and uh, so we have 175 organizations represented here from 24 countries. We have a quite a substantive uh, menu before you in the next two days. Okay, so if you have any food allergies or you are in the, uh, as we look at this menu, if you have any food al allergies or uh, are looking for any vegan options, you are in the wrong place. And uh, <laughs> so I hope you brought your steak knives and because uh, we are going to hear from, um, uh, we have quite a bit of substance here about what we've been working on technologically in the last year, what we're going to be working on technologically in the next year. Uh, we're going to hear from any number of our users about uh, how they are using this technology uh, in national security, in DOD, um, uh, uh, at EY, uh, Cargill, uh, and others. And so this gets quite, so we're going to end up in manufacturing and food supply and what we're doing in demand chain and supply chain and stochastic optimization of the supply chain, supply network, risk, uh, ESG, uh, national security. Uh, it's, um, I think you'll find it uh, quite interesting and quite substantive and a good use of your time. Uh, we are joined by a number of the members. Uh, okay, to be clear, Okay, uh, our primary purpose in this event is number one, to communicate what we're doing next so that you're ready for it, but most importantly, to learn from you, to hear from you uh, what it is that we need to do next. And uh, so we're joined by a number of members of the C3 uh, Board of Directors who are here to engage with you. Jim Snobby is a, a world-renowned figure in information technology, formerly the chairman of Maersk, formerly the chairman of Allianz, currently the chairman of Siemens, formerly the CEO of SAP. Uh, Jim is quite substantive. Many of you know him very well, and you'll find he can be quite helpful. Mike McCaffrey is here. Mike is our lead outside director. Uh, Mike, uh, as I recall, yeah, see, I've known Mike since he was the CEO of uh, Robertson Stevens, went on to run the Stanford Endowment, uh, is the, uh, currently runs a large investment firm uh, and called McKenna and serves as the chair, I believe, still of the Rhodes Scholars. And uh, Steve Ward has been associated with the company since the beginning. We have known Steve for decades. Um, uh, since Steve ran the PC business at IBM and then was CIO at IBM and then later became the CEO of Lenovo. At one point, he was Siebel Systems' largest customer. When he was CIO of IBM, I think we had 100,000 user sales marketing customer service system involved, uh, deployed globally across all aspects of IBM. And at, at the time, that was the largest enterprise application deployed on the planet. Uh, we're also uh, joined uh, by a number of distinguished members of our advisory board who are a very, very important part of this uh, senior uh, leadership team. Uh, we're very pleased that Jacques Attali was able to join us uh, from Paris. Uh, Jacques is, um, uh, was uh, uh, chief of staff to Francois Mitterrand. He was involved in crafting the European Union. He is the author of uncountable books, a great intellectual, a very smart guy, and a very important member of the C3 team. And he is a special advisor uh, to President Macron. Uh, General Cardone is with us. Uh, General Cardone is a very experienced uh, senior uh, army officer, and his um, last position before he retired was the commander of the U.S. Cyber Command. Uh, uh, General Hyten uh, has become a key member of the leadership team. Uh, General Hyten was most recently um, uh, vice chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Before that, he ran STRATCOM, so that would be the person in charge of the entire U.S. nuclear arsenal. Uh, he uh, is a career Air Force officer 
and uh, graduate from Harvard. Uh, and I uh, spent some time at the University of Illinois uh, studying, I believe, nuclear engineering. And uh, we're very pleased to have his leadership. Uh, Lord Sarfraz is here from the UK. Uh, he is a member of parliament, a uh, great, great and uh, important member of the team in EMEA and uh, provides great leadership and advice and counsel on how we comport ourselves in those markets. And George Matthew is an important member of our advisory board. He served as the president and chief operating officer of Alteryx. And uh, so he was the guy who built that company. For those of you who are interested in what we're doing in Ex Machina, uh, George is a pretty good guy to talk about. We can compare the capabilities of Ex Machina to um, Alteryx. This is all about Ex Machina. This is this tool that some of you or many of you are using and some of you will be familiar with, which is the tool that we have to address the citizens' data science community. Finally, we're joined by uh, Sir Gordon Messenger. Uh, Sir Gordon is uh, something of a highly venerated uh, individual in the, uh, in the UK. Uh, he served as the commanding officer of the Royal Marines, the vice chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the Ministry of Defense, uh, and he currently commands the Tower of London. And if you ever had a chance to visit uh, Sir Gordon at the Tower of London, I can tell you it is the experience of a lifetime. Uh, we have a number of the uh, senior members of the leadership team here, of the management team of C3 in products, in marketing, uh, in sales. And we are here for one reason and one reason only, and that is to, well, we're here for a number of reasons. Number one, to let you know what we're doing, what we're doing next so that you can be ready for it. But you know, most importantly, we're here to learn from you how we can do our jobs better, okay, and, uh, and what, we're, what we should be doing technologically to meet your needs. So please, please, please uh, take advantage of that opportunity because, and uh, also be careful what you ask for because it might happen. So it's been uh, quite a journey since, um, I think, December of 2008. I sent an email out on a Sunday and to found this company. We raised $20 million by Monday, and we're off to the races. And the big idea was that we thought about this in 2008. You know, at this point in time, the information technology business might have been a $3 trillion business worldwide. Uh, when I started it in the industry uh, in the early 80s, the worldwide market for information technology was about 200 billion, so it had grown a little bit. We had gone through mainframe computing and mini computing and personal computing. Uh, we now had the internet and the cloud. Um, the uh, iPhone was out. And so we kind of thought about what was happening next, and it occurred to us at that time that what was happening next was going to be about elastic cloud computing, um, big data, the internet of things and then predictive analytics enabling us to build these kind of large-scale enterprise predictive analytics applications. And uh, you know, at this point, it, you know, when we think about 2008, I'm not sure what the worldwide market was for the, for the you know, AWS cloud, but it was pretty small. Uh, and uh, you know, most of the conversations we had in those days, 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, was in the boardrooms in, you name the city, Paris, Shanghai, New York was kind of a Tom. What don't you understand? What don't, what don't you understand about how our data will, uh, will never be in the public cloud? And uh, well, we didn't believe that. And so we spent about a decade and about a billion and a half dollars building this technology platform, which is a software platform that you know about, which consists of about you know a thousand microservices and an orchestration layer allowing these things to interoperate that provide all of the services necessary and sufficient to design, develop, provision, operate very large scale enterprise and medium scale and small scale enterprise uh, applications. And um, the, um, you know, now 14 years later, it turns out this might have been a pretty good idea because uh, this, this seems to be all of a sudden, you know, the world has moved from you know, Tom, what don't you understand about how our data will never be in the public cloud to, you know, how are we going to use AI to digitally transform our organization leveraging the cloud? So things have changed. Uh, we've gone from one out office in San Mateo to 15 offices around the world today in Sydney, Singapore, Munich, London, Rome, Paris, New York, Atlanta, Chicago, uh, Redwood City, and we'll go 
wherever we need to go to meet our customers' needs, uh, with the exception of China, because we don't, China's on the no-fly zone for us. Um, We've cut, as it relates to you know, our facilities around the world, we cut kind of a neat deal with, um, with WeWork about the time they went, got ready to go public the second time. And uh, uh, where we have a global arrangement where, with WeWork where we have private branded facilities all over the world and we're able to expand and contract from one end to another as we wish. So this is Paris, Rome, Sydney, London, Chicago, Wash uh, Tyson's Corner, uh, Munich, uh, Amsterdam, New York, uh, Houston, uh, Singapore, and uh, Guadalajara. So that, that arrangement works really well in allowing us to expand the business kind of very easily and move people where we need them to meet our customer requirements. Uh, we recently uh, expanded into a new facility in, uh, in uh, Redwood City because we had no place to sit. We're, we're a little different than most high-tech companies. We actually use our offices. And uh, so this is a 300,000 square foot facility. We moved into the first 185,000 square feet of it, which is this. And uh, these guys did a pretty good job. I mean, this is, it's been open now for, I think, about three weeks. And, you know, this is the entry and kind of social space. And this is customer visit center on the first floor. There's the lobby entryway. Uh, this is a uh, party we threw, uh, opening ho open house party that we threw um, a couple of weeks ago with, I think we had 500 people in attendance. And um, so give you a feel for what this headquarters looks like. Very high energy work environment. Uh, we are um, you know, enormously fortunate in the uh, quality of the human capital that we've been able to attract to the company. Uh, today, we are uh, about almost a thousand professionals who have are at work or have signed offer letters and are on their way to work. And uh, so the company has been growing apace uh, with the, the with our customer footprint. I, uh, interesting to note, if you look at the blue segments, kind of dark blue and light blue, th those are all technologists. Those are all computer scientists, data scientists. And so the bulk of this company, I mean, sales is the small yellow slice. We really don't have a lot of that. And we have some, you know, the rest marketing, you know, G, uh, F and A and, and what have you. But I mean, these are people who are innovating and developing technology to meet your requirements. And uh, that is the bulk of our human capital. So this is a very, very unusual human capital distribution. Um, we are very fortunate in the um, number of people that seem to want to come to work for us. We're generally recognized as one of the great places to work in the world. Uh, in the last year, we had 92,000 job applicants. We interviewed 9,000 and we hired 363. So that would be an order of magnitude, maybe two orders of magnitude more selective than Princeton. Uh, these people are exceptionally qualified. They're exceptionally well-trained. Okay, and then I think culturally understand, then, then they have to pass a cultural screen. Uh, we're, we're not, you know, we're, while we're perceived as a great place to work, I would say we're a very unusual company in the sense that, you know, we work from the office, um, you know, we, we're, we're not the woke company. You know, we kind of don't do woke. You know, we, we do work. And if you want it woke, go talk to 
you know, Mark Benioff or somebody like the Prince of Wokeness, okay? We don't do woke. I don't talk about social issues or political issues. We have, we have one job, okay, in the office, okay? That's, that, that's to make sure that our customers succeed. That's the only job we have, okay? We encourage everybody to exercise their First Amendment rights and believe in whatever they believe in. Just do it someplace else, okay? Because we have a job to do. Uh, we have a very flexible, okay, work environment. Uh, we uh, had a voluntary work from, uh, work from the office program that went into effect June 15th, uh, 2021. You could either voluntarily work at, be at your desk or voluntarily have gone to work someplace else. So that's the, the, <laughs> that's the voluntary work from office environment. Um, but we, we, there, people like this do exist, and this is who I, 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 I let's go backwards. I assure they do, you they do, because these 363 people, I mean, they, the, the final screen that they passed, and this was the tough one. I mean, people with PhDs at MIT are a dime a dozen, okay? Okay, those who have a book in the hand, those who like to work with customers, those who like to work it together in teams, those who like to work, okay? You know, and, and work is that they're not wrestling every day with work-life balance because they love to work. I mean, those people do exist. Now, I'm just not saying these are better life choices than people who decide to work from home four days a week in their pajamas and get paid in Bitcoin, okay? That might be a better life choice. Okay, but, but I'm sure you, this psychographic does exist and those are the people, this is who we are, this is what we are, and that's who you are, okay, you will like it here. And if, that's, and, and if you're that other kind of person, you should go to work for Salesforce or, or, or something. The good news is there's lots of companies that, that you know, will support kind of any kind of crazy work habits these days. We just don't have to be one of them. Okay, uh, the, uh, uh, now then we invest in our human capital. I mean, these people that we hire out of MIT and Schlumberger and Harvard and Princeton, I mean, they're technically obsolete the day that, that they get here. And so we, I mean, this is a very rapidly moving field. Okay, so we have a program, I think um, about 58% of our uh, employees have advanced degrees. Uh, 9% of our employees have PhDs. Many of our employees want to go on and get additional advanced degrees or an advanced degree in computer science or data science. And so we formed a partnership with the University of Illinois at Urbana that has the number one ranked program in online master's programs in data science and computer science. And if people want to attend that program, they can. Uh, they have to get, first of all, they have to get admitted, which is not that easy. But if you can get admitted, we pay the, all, the, all, the, all the tuition and fees. You do this on your own time. Uh, when you graduate, you get a 15% increase in salary, a $25,000 cash bonus, and an additional equity award uh, to date, I think. Uh, and it, 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 this is a very, very substantive curriculum at a serious institution. And uh, as of today, we have 31 graduates who, uh, uh, as part of this program, and it's something we really encourage. And I think people have you know, enriched their careers uh, in, in um, substantially through this program. We also have uh, uh, curated a, uh, uh, a curriculum through Coursera, where we have online courses available in data science and deep learning, Kubernetes, cloud computing, reinforcement learning, um, whatever it might be. And we pay bonuses to our employees that vary, I think, between about $500 and $1,500 to get their certificates of completion. And I think we have about 2,500 people have completed these courses to date. There, we paid out about almost $3 million in bonuses, and this is the most important $3 million we spent, I think, in the last 15 years. And I think you know, as it relates to this business of how the workforce is changing and the new skills you need, as CEOs, the decisions we make, I mean, are you gonna, are you gonna train your workforce or are you gonna replace your workforce? Well, it's much easier to train it than it is to replace it. And so we're committed to continually training. Culture, okay, this is, again, this is, this is not the woke company. Okay, we don't do that, you know, we're, we're here to do work. And um, it's, um, it's uh, I think this says it all. This is, the, this is a picture of our parking lot two Fridays ago at uh, 3.35 p.m., 3.30. 
Okay, that is the only full parking lot in Silicon Valley. Okay, now I'll tell you what the rest of Silicon Valley looks like, okay, at 3.30, okay, at, okay, Friday, um, March 24th, it looks like the building next door. Okay, that's what the rest of Silicon Valley looks like, okay? And so, I mean, guys, I mean, this really says a lot. I mean, there's no parking places available at 30. I go, what are these people doing at 3.30? Oh, they're working from home, right? They're working from home. Okay, come on. Who is kidding who? Okay, okay. Now, okay, enough said. Uh, investing in products, uh, we continue to enhance the platform. We've built third-party integrations with virtually every uh, data science, data integration, um, uh, machine learning, application development, data visualization, uh, virtualization tool that's out there in the market, open source or proprietary. And so our architecture, you know, so what this architecture is not only uh, provides all the services necessary and sufficient to solve these classes of problems that we need to solve. It is it serves as an orchestration layer uh, where we can uh, we have future proof to this guy by enabling our customers to insert whatever technology they have that they might want to put in place if they want to use. We happen to use. Um, uh, a, a product called Rave for virtualization. Many of our customers want to use Databricks. Fine, put Databricks in. No harm, no foul. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, SageMaker or Azure ML, you know, everybody uses R and Python and Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, some people you have, have uh, um, assets in SaaS or data aggregates in whatever data lake uh, project it may be that they've been engaged in the last 10 years, okay, and, uh, you know, there, but there was something good that came out of that, so we can use those data aggregates and just and resolve them. So as we have advancements in, um, uh, in these technologies, like many of our customers wanted to move from relational database technology to Snowflake, no harm, no foul, just put in Snowflake. And all the applications you develop continue to run. So this, this is part of this model-driven architecture that we've developed that's really quite important. Uh, we've uh, considerably advanced our, our application footprint. Okay, and today we have 42, I think, maybe a few more uh, turnkey applications out. I mean, it used to be, you know, do people want t tools or do they want a platform? Well, they've gotten over wanting to build a platform themselves because everybody has failed at that. Okay, and now it's figured, people have figured out now they don't even want a platform. What they want is turnkey applications. Do you really want to build all the infrastructure you need to build to build an application to handle stochastic optimization of the supply chain, supply network risk, and demand forecasting? Because by the time you deal with persistence, queuing, ETL, security, access control, guys, these are really difficult problems. Do you really want to build that? Why don't you just install the application and get on with adding value to your shareholders. And so more and more we're seeing that this is the way the market is going and so this is where we are going from say scores of applications to you can expect hundreds of applications going forward. This is our footprint today across financial services, manufacturing, aerospace. I think many of you will be talking about what you're, what you're doing in supply chain, in ESG, in demand forecasting, uh, and other applications of these technologies in the course of the next two days. Uh, we're developing along these lines. We're making a big investment in Guadalajara, okay, in an application development center. Guadalajara is kind of a neat place, basically on the same time zone as us. These are all English-speaking people. They're extraordinarily well-educated, and you can you basically what we're building is a application development factory in Guadalajara. So we're going to see our facilities in Redwood City. Uh, evolve into facilities that develop the platform and the core technologies, okay? And then we apply these technologies and build the applications in Guadalajara. It's easy to get to, it's three hours, it's the same, same time zone, they all speak English, they're extraordinarily well-educated, and so we're making a big investment there. Intellectual property, uh, we've, been, we've made a, I think, a big investment in intellectual property over the years. We have, uh, I think, 130 patent applications on file. I think 26 patents have been granted, the most important of which is this patent, this omnibus patent that was granted 
uh, on uh, the systems, methods, and devices for an enterprise application development platform. This is the general idea of using a model-driven architecture to design, develop, provision, and operate uh, uh, enterprise uh, AI applications. And so we happen to hold all the intellectual property around this. We have ring-fenced this in patents, and uh, it's an important one. So we have today 130 patents on file. I think we put 21 patents on file within the last two weeks as it relates to uh, last month, maybe two months actually, as it relates to generative AI. I'll be talking about that, a little about that later. Okay. Our customer base has grown you know, pretty substantially over the years, but it's only grown at the rate which we can make sure the customers succeed. And so we are you know, extraordinarily fortunate to be considered, I believe we are considered, not technology providers, but if we get into Shell, okay, Baker Hughes, uh, Lion Del Basel, uh, uh, Coke Industries, uh, United States Air Force, I believe that we are believed, we, I know, okay, we are, we are perceived of as strategic partners. And these are not arm's length relationships. We are on speed dial, and we talk with many of these companies scores of times every day, uh, you know, on sometimes three or four continents. And, um, you know, if you're involved in, in, in some of these, I mean, the responsibilities are daunting. I mean, if you're involved with cargo in the distribution of $100 billion worth of food, hey, guys, I mean, you kind of can't make a mistake. I mean, you make a mistake, North Africa starves, okay? Um, you know, when you're involved in the development of medical supplies uh, or, you know, you're involved with some of these applications in the defense industry, I mean, this, this stuff is existential. So it, it, it's very serious, it's very sobering, and it's, um, you know, we don't take the responsibility lightly. To give you a feel for it, I'm going to give you just a feel for two customers and what they're doing. We've been extraordinarily uh, privileged to be chosen, you know, as the AI standard across all divisions of uh, Coke Industries. And Coke, as you know, is about a hundred billion dollar uh, private company in the United States. Uh, these people are, <laughs> these are people are, they are demanding, uh, they are steely eyed, they are competent. And uh, and uh, they're really fun to deal with. All there's only they have their eye on the ball at all times. There is only one question, and they that relates to every technology decision they make, and that's how much money am I making? Uh, and uh, uh, but it's it's a it's a great privilege to be a partner with this firm. And this can give you a feel for some of the things they're doing in one of the divisions of Coke Industries. give you a scale for what a paper machine is, you could easily have north of 5,000 sensors, and that's on a low end, in, in one paper machine. That paper machine can you know, produce like hundreds of thousands of records of data on a daily basis that we analyze to figure out what's working, what's not, why it's not working. Um, you know, a paper machine, it could be the size of a football field. It's a fairly complex uh, set of equipment that you know, requires a lot of different processes, different subject matter expertise to be able to produce, you know, thousands of tons of paper on a, on a daily basis. There's a lot of debate on, is digital really valuable? Is this, you know, adding value to the bottom line? Honestly, from my seat on the bus, not doing digital transformation is really not an option. From a data scientist point of view, especially one who's working in, you know, industrial IoT, um, you know, the, where time series are generated uh, in real time and they're often very large, and you need to make sense of that data, you really don't have a choice. It is a real value driver. The thing that I enjoy most, and this is this is relevant for all manufacturers, is the ability to combine various data sources into a platform, and not only just do that but make it happen in real time and make it work in real time. That to me is the most exciting and most fulfilling part of our collaboration between Georgia Pacific and C3 AI. When we collaborate with C3, we have data scientists who are really good at what they're doing. And that really allows us um, GP data scientists to bounce off ideas of, of one another and come up with a good strategy to tackle a, a huge complicated problem. 
What I would say to anyone who's on the fence or considering C3 AI is it really is an industrial strength data science platform. We are able within one platform, able to combine data engineering, data science, deployment, real-time scoring, visualization in one tool. The other part, which is so key to manufacturers, is the ability to combine data sources that we had only dreamed about before. To me, that led to increased model improvement, better accuracy, better uptime eventually on our assets, and again, the, the reduced unplanned events, the thing that guides the whole project. The predictive maintenance application we've been using, it absolutely has an impact on our bottom line. What we're able to do is empower our, our colleagues to spend 80% of their time addressing the problem as opposed to looking for them. This is where artificial intelligence comes in really handy. We've built a really powerful partner ecosystem, you know, and we're leaning in, you know, really hard. Uh, you know, think of our, our colleagues at Google are leaning in hard. Our colleagues at AWS are leaning in hard to make to make you successful at your projects. We we um, we appreciate that in the industrial sector. Our longest and, and most strategic relationship is with Baker Hughes. I think Baker Hughes is going to talk about some of the solutions they're using internally, but more importantly, uh, we've been taking the Baker Hughes uh, technology, uh, well, the C3 technologies to market through the Baker Hughes distribution organizations in partnership with them. Sometimes they sell, sometimes we sell, but we do get the job done, you know, at places like Shell and ExxonMobil and, and Petronas and and uh, Qatar Gas and Aramco and what have you. And uh, uh, I think we've closed, you know, three quarter, uh, maybe $650 million for the business with Baker Hughes. That's a, that's a big relationship. With NG, we're all over ESG and sustainability. FIS is our partner in the, um, in the uh, financial services space, in defense and intelligence. We've been working for some time, excuse me, with uh, Raytheon. And most recently, we formed an uh, enormously strategic partnership with Baker Hughes, or excuse me, with Booz Allen. Uh, and many of the Booz Allen re uh, uh, executives are represented here today uh, to better serve the Defense and Intelligence Committee and, uh, community, and they have a huge practice there. And so more to follow in terms of advancement of the partner ecosystem, but it's going to be critically important to the success of this company as we go forward. Uh, you know, a couple of comments on the World Economic Forum we attended this year. I haven't been there for 20 years. Okay, and uh, it's really changed. I mean, I, I think that I will say that it was a... You know, what I remember from the last time I was there was 20 years ago was kind of all this exercise in virtue signaling and wokeness and who could be more woke than the next guy and talking about all these kind of trendy um, Euro-like social issues. Uh, this, this conference was about... I mean, it's, number one, it was amazing how optimistic everybody was. I mean, everybody wasn't but was down in the dumps about war, and they weren't down in the dumps about recession. It's okay, we're going to have a recession next year. Let's get over it and get on with business. And so everybody's leaning forward. A lot of discussion about ESG, tons, and generative AI dominated every discussion about everything, social, uh, political, uh, business. People were like, what is it? How are we going to use it? What does it mean? How big a threat is it? Okay, and, and how can we take advantage of it? This is a discussion that we're having on ESG with a bunch of business leaders. Uh, here we're talking again about ESG with the leaders at uh, leadership of BlackRock and... Uh, uh, we've experienced some growth. We're roughly a quarter of a billion dollar business today. Um, we changed our pricing model some time ago from a uh, few quarters ago from a subscription model to a consumption based pricing model, making it much easier to acquire the technology. So it kind of flattens the revenue growth curve a little bit. So this year, our revenue will our revenue growth will be in single digits in the year that will end this quarter. Uh, but I think you'll rapidly see if you look at the math of the way this works, 
why do we go with consumption model? Because that's where the market is as it relates to the cloud. You know, this is how people want to, this is how our customers want to buy. This is how they buy from Snowflake. It's how they buy from, from, from AWS and Google and everybody else. And this is with whom we sell. So we brought our, our sales motion in synchrony with theirs and it is being extraordinarily well adopted. So we expect to see, you know, uh, this business growing kind of very rapidly, okay, in the next few years. We have, you know, shy of a billion dollars in the bank. I think we have about 800 million today. I think at the, we'll consume about $100 million of that in the next year as we continue this transition. And I think at a low point, we should get to about $700 million in cash. Why is that important? Because you know, in this tech downturn that we're seeing, and these layoffs, layoffs, layoffs that have just started. Okay, the next thing we see is the series A, B, C companies kind of closing, closing, closing their doors, and that human capital gets distributed to those who survive. This is what happens during these recessions. And uh, as you are, are well aware, and uh, <clears throat> the one thing I can assure you, uh, this is an ongoing concern. Uh, we, are, we are in a position to service our customers where uh, in a position to take care of our employees and their families. And um, we will be, we have what I would describe as a structurally profitable business. Okay, we made, so we run basically gross margins of about 78%. Okay, we made the decision, eyes opened, over invest in branding and over invest in marketing and over invest in R&D. And now as we bring those investments in line with industry norms, this becomes a cash positive profitable business uh, on a non-gap basis. And we expect to cross that line in the fourth quarter of next year, so about a year from now. We'll finish this year at roughly 1,100 employees, and that's the state of the business. The business is healthy, customers are happy, employees are motivated, market is huge, and the market is getting increasingly attenuated to AI. Now we have this issue of generative AI, which has come up, holy moly, how big is this? Guys, it's big, okay? I mean, it's hard to describe how big this is. And the, um, you know, we've been looking at this kind of very closely since about 2020. Who, Nikhil is going to talk about that when I think he talks about generative AI. Uh, and the, Nikhil Christian runs data science. And, uh, but I'm going to talk about how we came upon it. And we, there's lots, I, what, what, what's going on in chat is interesting. I think it's kind of cute, okay, right now. I think when it gets fully developed, it will be, you know, really very interesting for, for um, commercial applications. I don't think it's clearly not quite there yet. Okay, and uh, it's funny, these journalists love to bash it and how proud they were that they were able to get GP, you know, chat GPT-3 to crash in 40 minutes. Come on, any of you guys could do it in about eight minutes. Okay, what's, what's the big deal? Version one crashes. I mean, how long did it take to get Windows to work? That was the version three. Okay, anybody remember Oracle? That was version four. Okay, I was there. Okay, <laughs> took version four before it worked. Um, and uh, Larry didn't even release something called version one because he didn't think anybody would buy it. So he called the first release version two. So anyhow, the, the, the amount of billions of dollars that are being invested, this is a very, very rich vein, and we're tapping it for a very unusual purpose. So I want to talk about uh, one of the applications of this. This is a non-obvious purpose of this, of this, these large language models uh, is to, uh, you know, change the nature of the human computer interface. So let's take a look at how this has evolved. You know, so this is, you know, this has been driven, you know, for much of the, most of the time that we, uh, the computer age has been driven by the Hollerith card, where we had the integrated calculating machine in 1911 that later became a company called IBM. You've heard of them. Okay, and the, you know, the idea the Hollow Earth card was, you know, we looked at key punch machines and we coded, you know, one line of code at a time in a Hollow Earth card. I don't know if any of you have done it. Okay, I have done it. This is how I started computing. Okay, those people who, who well, I'll get to this in a minute, but, you know, we would have, you know, this is what big data looked like in 1960. The warehouse full of, you know, decks of Hollow Earth cards that we did in Fortran or COBOL or Algol. Uh, and um, then, you know, we had the um, development of kind of what we might call the first supercomputer at the University of Pennsylvania in 1946. And this is what the human interface was. Okay, this is, you know, maybe not that very, that friendly. 
And, uh, you, know, the, you know, when this thing stopped working, you know, they would often have to go into the machinery and take out the moth okay, or the beetle that was in there that was goofing it up. Well, this is how you debugged a computer. No, no, seriously, this is how you debugged a computer. Okay, this is where the term came from. You went, got the moth out of the machine, and then it would start working again because it was short-circuiting maybe between two vacuum tubes. And this person, okay, who would, was, was programming this calculated engine, okay, the, and they were almost all females, okay, this is what we call the, the, the term for this person. This was a computer. Okay, computers were almost invariably female, and they were the people who programmed these devices. Um, okay, and then we have, you know, then the, the, inter the interfaces began to get a little bit more sophisticated, not much, okay, in the 50s with the introduced, and then we have the mainframes as we know with IBM and, you know, what were we were computing on there were the Fortran and COBOL and ALGOL, and it was painful. And uh, I lived this dream. Okay, and then we had then we had the advent of the mini computers introduced by you know digital equipment and others, you know, PDP eight, PDP eleven, programming language, then the interface language was called Macro Eleven. Um, and um, you know, this is kind of what it looked like as you program it. In the meanwhile it would be spitting out a piece of, you know, uh, paper tape. Purple would be punching holes in about an inch wide. Some of you will remember that. That's how you stored your program. Then we had you know, the introduction of the personal computers. And uh, I have one of these on my desk at home. Okay, And I have gone through the instruction manual like 10 times and tried to figure out how to make the damn thing do something useful. And I'm telling you, it was pretty hard. I'm not sure anybody did anything useful with one of these. But that is your first personal computer right there, that and the MSI. OK, then DEC comes out with the VT100. OK, this was a big deal. It's about the same time we have 3270 devices at IBM. And these are command line interfaces, green screen with little carrots over on the left side. Everybody remember those days? OK, and, uh, and, um, and um, th then this was a huge development in programming with the C programming language out of these guys out of New Jersey. Kernigan and Ritchie, and then companies began to use C to basically allow end relational database technology that came online now, you know, in the 80s, that we brought online in the 80s at companies like Oracle Corporation and others to be able to get away from just command line interfaces on green screens and printouts on green and white striped paper, if you remember that stuff. And we then used these to develop forms and tables to represent data that we use for applications like ERP, um, uh, uh, manufacturing, and what have you. OK, then the introduction of the PC, as we think about it today, the, the Intel IBM PC, I mean, this was a really big deal. OK, and this introduced the opportunity for client-server computing. This, this was a game changer as it related for, to enterprise computing, as it related to NRP, uh, ERP, CRM, manufacturing, HR, what have you. And now with client-server computing, as you recall, we would have a network, we would have a server, we have a client device, but we had to install software on all the client devices, right? OK, to communicate with the server and, you know, it, you know, it, it, it was a, an advance, and it enabled us to, you know, to um, uh, kind of really distribute the computing power over a lot of machines that were, that were fully connected. Uh, and um, uh, the next advance that we had, Windows 95 was huge, OK, in, in taking technology that started at Xerox PARC. OK, and then was copied by Apple, OK, and then was copied by Microsoft in, Win in Windows 95. But it was a huge breakthrough in allowing us to build um, uh, graphically more friendly user interfaces. OK, in the mid-90s, we have the World Wide Web. The internet, as we think of it today, kind of spun out of the University of Illinois with uh, Mark Andreessen and Mosaic uh, that, you know, and kind of the rest is history. And one of the things we could do with the World Wide Web was build, uh, we developed something at Siebel Systems, uh, at Abbo and I and some others who are here in 2001, was Siebel version 7. Well, Siebel version 7 was a really important development in the human-computer interaction 
world because this was the first time we run enterprise applications in what we call a thin client architecture. So there was no, by thin client, there was no software installed on the, uh, on the desktop device. We were running this in any browser. And so this enabled us to much, really simplified the distribution of these applications, increased the ease of use, and this became, this was this user interface standard and model was copied by SAP, Oracle, PeopleSoft, virtually everybody, Salesforce, uh, and it is today still the standard in enterprise computing. Uh, and uh, now, uh, then, you know, in 2007, we have this development of the smartphone and... Uh, An iPod, a phone, <laughs> and an internet communicator. An iPod, <laughs> a phone. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. We are calling it iPhone. Okay, well, this is pretty big. I mean, so now we've moved from millions of people engaging in computer applications to billions of people. And uh, let's acknowledge, I mean, that, that was a game changer. And except we look, you know, we look at the state of, you know, enterprise applications today, you know, it, you know it, they're still a little clunky looking. Okay, and I mean, I mean, nobody can use this stuff. Okay, and you know, whether it's CRM or, or SAP or supply chain, I mean, some specialists might be able to use it. And, you know, you memorize the, you know, you know, it's like using any of you guys, some of you guys use a Bloomberg terminal. I mean, come on, it's impossible. Nobody can use that. And um, so we've done a pretty good job at developing unusable applications, and now it's a half a trillion dollar business. Who would have thought? Uh, we, we like to think we've made a little bit of progress at C3AI, okay, in more modern user interface technology that has facilitated ease of use, but we have a long way to go. Which leads me to generative AI. Okay, how big is this? It's difficult to describe. Okay, and uh, we're, you know, we're going to see billions of dollars invested in this every year by IBM and Google and Microsoft and they are going to, and others, and they are going to leapfrog one and the Turing Institute and the, and the Academy, MIT and Illinois and Princeton and Berkeley and Stanford. Okay, and we're going to see open source this and open source that and it's just going to become increasingly functional. And, you know, who cares if he can get you to crash in eight questions today? Just stay tuned. I mean, th this is an important piece of technology. And the way that we, we've been working with it for a couple of years, but I want to tell you how the story we got involved in it, and how we got involved at this time. And I got an email from somebody in this room who's going to scold me later for showing this, okay, um, uh, uh, you know, as I frequently will. Now, this person sends an email or text a lot on Saturdays and Sundays, which is fine because I work on Saturdays and Sundays. And, but you know, this is the email. It said, it said, Tom, I want to be the Google for DOD. A user asks a question, gets an answer. How do I make that happen? Like, duh, I mean, pretty good question, right? And, and you know, I mean, we've got, we get a lot of customer, uh, uh, I mean, we've been driven by customer uh, requirements. And a lot of the specifications are multiple pages that got it very, very clear. You know, this is exactly what we want. This is kind of a general statement. And it really piqued my interest. Like, ah, a user asks a question okay, and gets an answer. How do I make that happen? And I thought about that and I consulted with some of my colleagues in the defense community. I said, well, what, what, what's the genesis of this? And they said, kind of, so, Tom, this is the way it works. You know, General Milley, who's the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, you know, asked a question in the, in the, at the Joint Chiefs meeting, and there are no computers in the room because that's the way it works. And um, he wants to know what his satellite coverage is in Indopaycom, or what our diversity goals are in the, in the Army Reserves, how are we doing against our diversity goals, or how are we doing, you know, or whatever it might be. Okay, that question gets assigned to two two stars. Okay, it gets assigned to, you know, like 10 captains. Okay, that gets designed to 16 corporals, that goes to 16 CIOs. Okay, and six weeks later, people show up with two PowerPoint slides to show them the answer. That is the way that it works. Okay, and so I thought, so I got in a room 
So and my response was, you know, good idea. Give me a couple of weeks to ideate this and propose a plan. And so I got together with, um, this is September. And now it's the middle of September 2022. So this is the last year. And I got together with um, Nikhil Christian, who you'll be on stage today, and Ed Abba, who I suspect will be on stage. And if he's not, you all know him anyway. Um, and we started thinking about this. We said, Google for DOT. What, 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 what does that mean? And I thought, well, wait, let's look. What is this? Okay, this is this is a user interface for complex computing applications that everybody in the world knows how to use. The chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Chiefs of Staff knows how to use this. The private on the flight line at Wright Patterson Air Force Base knows how to use it. The CEO of Coca-Cola knows how to use it. Okay, the consumer of Coca-Cola knows how to use it. The CEO of Stanford Hospital knows how to use it. The guy in charge of oncology at Stanford knows how to use it. The physician and the patient at Stanford knows how to use it. Everybody knows how to use this application. Well, why don't we think about using this, this interface? And so the way this works, if you go and you type in Enterprise AI, this is the answer you get. It says it gives you, it says comes up with a snippet, it says tell you what Enterprise AI is, and then it cites where, you know, it gives you the citations of where to go to find more information. Go to the C3 website. These are more, there's other questions that you might ask. What does C3AI actually do? Good question. I keep asking that myself. Okay, what is, what is, okay, what is AI, NVIDIA AI Enterprise? Okay, and then there, what are other sources that we might go to to find more information about Enterprise AI? How many times does this application get used today? I have no idea, but it's in lots and lots of, I don't know whether it's in scores of billions, hundreds of billions or trillions, because I don't work at Alphabet, but I know it's a big number. Okay, so the, the, well, the idea that we thought about is could we take the, that we, that we ideated was this idea of taking the, basically the Google user interface, okay, combining this with NLP, reinforcement losing, learning, okay, the Google search UI, a generative AI, uh, predictive analytics, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, deep learning, to see if we could fundamentally change the nature of the human interface so somebody can just ask a question and get the answer. And so, you know, if you look at the architecture that we've developed, and I talked about this as an orchestration layer, where, for example, we integrate, you know, we can integrate with, you know, new machine learning libraries that come out, or TensorFlow that might come out, or, or Snowflake, or whatever comes next, we're able to just plug it in and use it. And so when we have new developments in OpenAI, uh, be it from, uh, be it, you know, uh, a Flan T5 from Google, from Alphabet, or, or BARD, or, or OpenAI, or ChatGPT, we can immediately take advantage of that. And so we talk about it, we just plug it into our architecture, and it works. I don't have to invent it. And so what does it look like when you combine these things, okay, in one use case? You kind of get a use case that looks like this, okay, where you take NLP, and reinforcement learning, and generative AI, And you ask it a question like, how are we doing against our CO2 reduction objectives? Okay, and it gives you the answer, it gives you the detailed snippet over on the right, and it tells you where else in the enterprise can you look to find this information? In what other applications? Be it Tableau, Salesforce, SAP, Palantir, uh, a PDF, uh, some uh, Word documents, whatever it might be. I mean, why not use it? Everybody knows how to use it. And so let's take a look at it in action. You know, here, you know, you know, as I go, you know, here, as I type in, you know, as I type my question, how are we doing against our, so it does uses, you know, generative AI to, um, uh, uh, you know, provide, you know, what question do you want to ask? It provides you the initial answer, okay? It gives you, you know, great detail against it. It gives you what the answer is. There's your gap to plan. We'll see more about this later. Here's the detail about the plan. Here are the other sources in the enterprise, be it you know, C3, be it Tableau, be it Microsoft, wherever it might be. This is the model. So let's take a look at it. Organizations are managing diverse data sets and complex reporting requirements to meet ambitious ESG commitments. 
chief sustainability officers, reporting managers, and analysts find it increasingly complex to navigate large volumes of data across disparate information systems, and find emissions and ESG-related data, identify improvements, and create compliant ESG reports. C3 Generative AI for ESG provides enterprise users with a transformative user experience using a conversational natural language interface to rapidly locate, retrieve, and present all relevant data across an entire corpus of an enterprise's information systems. Using deep learning and generative AI models, C3 Generative AI for ESG understands natural language queries constructed by users and helps users find and rapidly retrieve relevant answers. From a simple query, C3 Generative AI for ESG provides a rich landing zone for users to find relevant results across enterprise and external data, systems, and applications. The results card provides the best AI-inferred answer to the question at hand. Users can read a summary and dive deeper into recommendations for action. Review supplemental information through the feature detailed snippet. Converse with generative AI models and ask follow-up questions in the chat and provide feedback to continuously improve search results. The search results section offers a stack-ranked list of relevant application pages, analytical dashboards, and media of all types such as investor and competitor press releases, policy letters, and sustainability reports. Armed with this information, chief sustainability officers can inform the company's ESG strategy, monitor emerging risks, and proactively keep disclosures and plans in line with stakeholder expectations. In this notional example, a chief sustainability officer using C3 Generative AI for ESG can instantly access information across all enterprise applications, such as health and safety, HR, enterprise resource planning, and others as well as the numerous siloed data sources such as environmental audits, diversity and inclusion programs, energy efficiency programs, and supplier engagement initiatives. An ESG professional may want to ask questions such as, are any of our energy efficiency projects at risk? Or, how are we doing against our CO2 reduction goals? From its single results page, C3 Generative AI for ESG organizes and summarizes information to make it easier for users to find what they are looking for. In this case, C3 Generative AI for ESG provides a summary of the company's CO2 reduction by 2040 plan, including the mitigation measures required to reach the target. AI models provide forecasts of the business-as-usual scenario and calculate the gap to plan at every point in time into the future. The user receives a summary response in natural language that provides full context. In addition, C3 Generative AI for ESG automatically presents detailed information about the composition, progress, and financial impact of the plan to date. After reviewing the initial search results, the user has a follow-up question that can immediately continue the chat by asking, how can I get my plan back on track? C3 Generative AI for ESG returns the top AI recommendations to accelerate decision-making, building on the prior interaction. The user can deep dive into specific AI recommendations or review the AI evidence packages. The search results also capture relevant pages from other applications like Workiva, EcoStructure, Resource Advisor, and SAP, and locate relevant performance and efficiency insights from dashboards such as Sphera, as well as relevant documents of recent policies or management information reports. C3 Generative AI for ESG uses advanced generative AI techniques to help accelerate time to insight. Visit c3.ai slash ESG to learn more. So we've been working on this since September, okay, and we will show you in the course of the next two days uh, C3 Generative AI working with ESG, okay, working with reliability, working with C3 CRM, working with supply network risk, okay, and working with kind of any other number of applications. Uh, it's in early um, uh, beta use today at EY, Baker Hughes. And we have a very interesting application that we'll show you that we're using as part of the C3 uh, application stack. Um, so how will we use it? Okay, we're gonna use it to fundamentally change the human-computer interaction model as it relates to our C3 applications. Okay, it used to be, uh, you know, as we, as we make these applications, so you use AI to make enterprise applications predictive rather than simply descriptive. I mean, rather than just tell us how much information, how much, in, uh, how much in inventory we had in, in the supply chain, where our failures in the supply chain were, 
okay, what our customer churn was, okay, how many out, uh, and money laundering events occurred three months ago, six months ago, nine months ago, is years ago, we can use predictive analytics to tell us how much inventory we need in each bin in the supply chain from here to Shenzhen in order to meet the demand function deliver on time in full. We can use it for demand forecasting, and we'll see examples of that today. We can use it rather than to tell us where the supply chain failed, we can predict where the supply chain will fail so we can put a mitigation plan in place and avoid the failure, again, deliver on time in full. Rather than tell us what our customer churn was, it can tell us which of our customers are going to leave, okay, in the next six months so we can take some action to save them. So this is a fundamental change in the nature of uh, enterprise application software, and this promises to be a $600 billion software market in not very many years. Now, this was the, the, the big issue. We used to be constrained by our ability to aggregate data into unified federated Im images. Guys, we've trivialized that, okay? I mean, at, at massive scale, okay? We used to be constrained by our ability to process you know, data sets this size Okay, well today we can spool up tens of thousands of virtual machines, okay, operating in parallel, doing 24-bit floating point operations at three gigahertz cycles and solve problems that were previously unsolvable. We used to, you know, what we used to, it wasn't that long ago, that big data is something we moved inside of the machine room. Anybody remember a machine room? Okay, with a forklift. Okay, I remember that. It wasn't that long ago. We used to. Everybody used to have that with a glass. You know, every computer company had that with you know a glass wall because so you could show your customers how proud of it with all those vaxes and three seven and, and IBM seven seventies back there, whatever they were. Um, uh, well, that's that's gone. Okay, we don't move data with a forklift anymore. And so, the re what, what's the problem now in terms of what's the constraint? Well, we have trivialized these problems, okay, of, of designing, developing, provisioning these operating, operating these problems at scale. What's the, what's the problem? Change management, getting people to use these applications. Okay, number one, having a user interface that's usable, but also making it explainable and intuitive. Well, why not use a user interface that everybody in the world already knows how to use? Even if you don't know how to use a computer, you know how to use the Google user interface, let's use it. And so by combining with these, with these technologies, we can do that. I think this is a really big idea. And uh, I, as you can imagine, okay, we now have patents on this uh, on file, okay, in, uh, in 21 countries uh, to secure the intellectual property. We did that before we demonstrated it. And uh, I think it is, uh, this is a non-obvious use of these uh, open AI models, but something that I think is going to be, um, I mean, this is probably as big as the iPhone. This is a big one. Um, so um, that's what we're up to. Uh, we very much look forward to engaging with you in the next couple days and in learning you know, how we can do our jobs better for you. Uh, we thank you for your time. We thank you for the privilege of allowing us to be part of your team. Um, I can tell you on the behalf of roughly 1,000 people at C3AI, it is uh, a great privilege and the professional experience of a lifetime. So thank you for that. And um, thank you for the courtesy that you extended to me this morning.